Okay, good. All right, so this is uh, some of the sources, what's on the screen that I uh, sent out on Friday, if I recall correctly. And um, there was another page of sources as well that I sent out. Um, just a quick review, what I basically was discussing about is the approach of Chazal last week, is what uh, the approach of Chazal to art, to uh, Avodah Zarah, is there any or not? Um, so I want to move right away into the next thing. First of all, there's a whole debate in our sages. It starts in the Talmud. It goes all the way through to the Middle Ages. Yesh mazal Yisrael or en mazal Yisrael? Is the signs, do the celestial bodies affect the children of Israel or not? One of the things implicit, at least in the early stages of the argument, is that the mazalot, the signs of the zodiac, affect non-Jews. The question is, do they affect Jews? And it's a debate that goes on all the way to the Rambam who says, all this astrology stuff is uh, malarkey. Uh, and right at the same time, Rav Levi van Gershom and the Ibn Ezra who consider it science. We'll get back to this shortly. The other thing I wanted to do, two quick things. Uh, Yui was correct. Uh, at that point in time, there are no churches with zodiacs. They do have, however, Helios, Helios and Helene, right nearby the one in Beit Alpha. It's um, in Beit Shan. And you also have the Four Seasons in one of the churches at Petra. But correct, that whole combination does not exist. Later church art has mosaics of the, the or art of the uh, zodiac circle with the person in the middle being Jesus. Okay, now let's move right along. So my next, um, let's put this into big. How do I get this into big? So guys, um, basically one of the things I was trying to show is that two dimensional art, according to most of the sages is not prohibited whatsoever. Even though, for example, a photograph like this that you're seeing, uh, those are my granddaughters, um, some of them, uh, that is certainly much better than the next picture as far as portraying something. And I don't know of anybody who says you can't take photographs, look at photographs or anything like that, certainly today. So that would seem to go along with what I showed earlier from Rav Cook. So now let's get right down to the Zodiac and other stuff. Theories that exist. Um, oh, one other th uh, thing. Uh, no, we'll get to that later. Um, the first theory that was espoused as to what this means, what does the zodiac and Helios mean, and the stars and moon and sun, um, was given by uh, Aviona and continues to this day, especially with Rachel Chachlili. In English, it's written Chachlili, but it's a uh, Chet. Okay. Basically, they say this is a calendar. In her most recent book, Rachel, in 2013 goes into a lot of details how in second century, third century, leading up to the mosaic that we have in um, Hamat Veria, this is from Beit Alpha, but leading up to that, there were a huge number of mosaics done for calendar purposes. And basically Avionat says, and she continues to say this verily unto this day, that these are calendars and that's where for calendar purposes. Um, Aviona connects it also to the Mishmarot Kuhuna, the 24 courses of Kohanim, the 24 families that served. This was found in a lot of uh, ancient Batei Knesset and in sources. The, um, and he says that there's a, this whole connection. And part of the connection goes to a little bit to what uh, Eli Ducker was talking about. Um, the Kaliri in one of his poems has the Mishmar, the city that the Mishmar was in, the zodiac sign, and the month. Now that would seem to play into this whole concept. There's just a couple problems with this concept. I hear somebody. I think you didn't mute everybody, Judy. But okay. All right, working on it. Okay, so I, I think that, that, that um, 
there's possible problems. One problem is at um, Chamatveria, the signs in the quarters, the four seasons, go uh, correctly fit with the uh, signs of the zodiac. In none of the others, not Naaran, not Petafa, not uh, Ustria, not any of the ones that exist. Ustria, by the way, is sometimes referred to as Chusefa. So in none of them do the signs of the zodiac correspond to the seasons. If you're using it as a calendar, you'd think um, that would be necessary. What does support their view, remember Avi wrote this in 1964, later in the 60s, they found the Bet Knesset in En Gedi, where you just have the listing of the signs of the zodiac and the months right next to each other. Further reinforcement definitely comes 1993, the mosaic in Sipori, where you've got in the signs of the mosaic, the months together with the signs of the mosaic, seems to support this view, but again, it's a little bit problematic. Like I say, they don't line up, except at Hamat Ferry. Okay, the next point of view was basically a whole school of them, starting with uh, Sukenik, uh, going on afterwards, um, Ephraim Elimelech Orbach, not in connection to synagogue mosaics, to all the mosaics from ancient, uh, let's call it Greco Roman, etc., art, a guy named Crowfoot. Crowfoot, Crowfoot. Uh, all these guys basically say, it's just the design, it's just decoration, it's got nothing to do with nothing. Um, Stephen Fine basically almost agrees, but he says, no, there are messages in the art, but there's no program. Nothing's connected, that you've got Akedat Yitzchak below this scene and you've got other things above it. It's got nothing to do everything with each other. Slightly reinforcing that it's got nothing to do in the one in Hamat Tveria, wait, let's go back, Hamat Tveria, where was that? Way up, let's go way up, hold on. I know it's here somewhere. Well, no, I don't have it. I moved it further down, I guess. Hold on one sec. Let's get back to where we were. Okay, in the one in Hamat Tveria, the Aaron Kodesh, there, that's it. The Aaron Kodesh is not, there's no program going top to bottom, it's off to the side. And there's no biblical scene whatsoever. So again, if there's supposed to be some sort of set message. Um, the problem with the three of the Prime Elimelech Orbach, of Sukenik and the others, that there's no particular message in the Zodiac or in other stuff is that generally speaking, Ancient mosaic art did have a message. There are some that are just for the design, you know, some flowers, the uh, edging around the side that looks like a Persian carpet. So let's go on to the next reason, reason number three, astrological or cosmological, astrological, cosmological. So this is a one that we might know. It's chariot is Argaman. That's the sun, which is set on high and rides on a chariot and illuminates the world. If, uh, if that's the case, what do we have a picture of in the mosaic here? Perhaps just that's how they drew the sun. So you got sun, moon, stars, seasons, and the like. Um, if it's astrology, though, what would you expect? You'd expect a little bit more accuracy again as far as placements of the seasons with, uh, let's go to this one. Uh, sun in Midrashic literature, so you've got Shira Shirim Rabbah, sorry, Amid by Rabbah, the quotes from Shira Shirim, and you've got Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, the sun is riding on a chariot and rises with the crown as a bridegroom, the crown being the way we see it in the zodiac wheel. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip that and that, and uh, then we're over here. Um, Good and upset, it can't be scientific archaeology, uh, astrology again because it's maybe not as aligned as could be, should be. He also felt that there could be no connection to Piotim, as it's mentioned by Elie Ducker, because he thought all those Piotim came from the Middle Ages. We now know that they're 6th and 7th century, same time as this mosaic right over here that we're looking at. Okay, um, along the line that it's uh, cosmological, what does that mean? that you're representing the cosmos. 
they have, uh, what are you representing? So next, let's hold up the book to my face. So you guys see the book? Everybody? Hopefully. It's a book by Mayor Bar Ilan. This is an Orthodox uh, professor at Bar Ilan University, as it happens. Uh, it's called Astrology and Other Sciences of the Jews of the Land of Israel in the Hellenistic, Roman, and Byzantine period, saying basically that astrology is viewed as a science. In fact, till the 16th century, there were many people that viewed astrology as a science. They would say, no, that's astronomy. That's the way we think of it since the 16th century. Back then, to many people, astrology is a science. So let's go back up. And we have, whoops, no, why is it doing that? Okay. So we have um, this as science, and what does it mean? So there are those who say it's sun, moon, stars, um, going along with the Midrash that this is just the sun, the way they drew the sun. You give a kid today a box of crayons, and there's two ways they draw the suns with triangles coming out of it or with straight lines coming out of it. This is the way they drew the sun, riding its four horse quadriga, like the Midrash says, it's sun, sun, moon, stars, seasons in a sense, um, the months or the signs of the zodiac, the signs of the zodiac and the months, and that this is just uh, like that. But what Bari Lan says, what Ness, uh, Ness the guy wrote a doctorate about astrology in the Jewish uh, community in the, in the uh, Byzantine period, um, they say, no, what's being represented isn't just the sun. What's being represented inside there is not Helios, not Sol Invictus, but God. In other words, this is a representation of the Rabbana Shalom. So let's skip down to the Rambam. Maimonides in Laws of Repentance, I'm sorry guys, I didn't, uh, I wasn't able to get the English edition or some sort of translation done, says, um, No, sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm reading the wrong line. Okay. Just a minute. Let me try and, do you see where I'm pointing? Over there, in Zion. That he's got an image. That this is against our faith. This is a meme. Okay. Right away, the rivet, Abraham ben David of Poskier from Provence, says on this, why is he called this a mean? The Kamagdolim, the Tovimi men, all the people that are better and greater than him, went along these lines. The Fim Masha Uvam Korot, what they saw in the sources. So uh, Moshe Her, who I mentioned before, has a, uh, sorry, not Moshe Her, this guy, Mayor Bairiman, has a very long article just about the hand of God. Um, the article is probably accessible online. The hand of God basically he says a lot of things that we think anthropomorphism today, we say, oh no, we don't do images. They believed in it, or at least some of them did. And he basically shows how some of the statements of Chazam, Midrashim, all sorts of them, uh, were basically what the Ravad, Rabbi Abraham ben David, is saying that uh, there are lots of people that did believe that there were ways to portray the Rabbana Shalom in images. And that's basically what, he, what they're saying this represents. Okay, let's go to, uh, no, I don't like that one. We'll go back up just a little bit, sorry guys. Okay, so now, that's the second possibility. Third, uh, the, sorry, third possibility. Fourth possibility. What's called the eschatological um, Yaffa Englard uh, 
Forrester, Rina Talgam, a whole bunch of them say um, that it shows, um, how should we say, the continuity. The heavens, the stars, the sun, the moon, it goes along with the Midrash, but it's not saying um, that there's astrological here. It's more of just the way to represent the continuity in this world. Um, uh, there's also Asher Ovadia says this, uh, Kunel, a whole bunch of people. So let's go to a good little Midrash that goes with it. Yalkut Shimoni says, Sidro Shal Olam, Shnei Masar Sha'ot, there's 12 hours by Yom. Shnei Masar Sha'ot by Laila, there's 12 hours at night. Shnei Masar Chodeshim, there's 12 months. Shnei Masar Mazalot, there's 12 signs of the Zodiac. Shnei Masar Shvatim, there's 12 tribes. Yachol Ani Levatel Min Hag Sidro Shal Olam, how can I cancel the way the world is ordered? Twelve is part of the order. We could even go, uh, and by the way, there was one of the mosaics that was thought to be originally a uh, Galgal Mazalot, a circle of the zodiac, in Yafia. It ends up that it's not, it's the twelve tribes. So if that's twelve tribes, this Midrash shows you in a sense the way that they saw things, that the signs of the zodiac, the months of the year, the tribes, everything like that, all are showing the order in the world. This is part of the Sidurosh Olam, the order in the world. And that's one of the theories. Let's go on. Number five in my theories. Um, let me get to a different mode there, this one. Do you guys see, uh, I hope you see, uh, somebody give me a thumbs up, I see Rene, the um, mosaic from uh, Hamat Feria. Yeah, okay. So Mosaic from Hamat Varia. That's the one where the seasons and everything lines up. According to almost everybody, end of fourth century, fourth century, end of fourth century. What happened in the 350s in the fourth century in Judaism? Hillel, second Hillel, sets the calendar. Our set calendar basically was then just adjusted a little bit in the Gaonic period. And that's what we use today. So it uh, comes along. Um, uh, Levine, uh, Lee Levine, and a few others, and say, no, what, what's happening, and this goes back a little bit to the calendar theory of uh, Aviona and Rachel Chachlili, that the calendar here is to, um, that this was to basically affirm the set calendar that's now both sort of a lunar calendar and the solar calendar, like we adjusted to fall in line with the solar calendar, and that that's why this was put into the shul. In this synagogue, by the way, we've got the inscription, the patriarch, okay? That inscription associating with somebody who's in the circle of the patriarch donating part of the thing. So uh, Levine says maybe this is a uh, calendar, yes, in this one, but not in the others. In other words, the other words maybe borrow the concept, that's why it doesn't necessarily line up. And they weren't meant to be a calendar, but that this one specifically was because of the intercalation of the Jewish calendar. Okay, let's go on to reason number six. Reason number six, um, and that gets specifically to Helios, or Saul Invictus over there, and in the others. Uh, it was very common on 4th century Roman coins, even after Constantine becomes Christian, even after the empire officially becomes Christian. So there's a school of thought that this was sort of like a way of saying, we're loyal servants to the empire. We, we're, we're, we support Rome. Okay? We're okay. Nothing to worry from us. We're... Uh, uh, we're Jews, but we support Roman. Uh, it doesn't really explain all the other stuff around it. You can maybe stick a little Helios in some place on the side. You don't have to make it quite so central. Okay. Number seven, there's a program. And the program means that when you look at the... Um, uh, let's go up a little. When you look at the Avram, uh, you know, the binding, the Akedah scenes, you look at the 
um, let's call it both tabernacle and temple at the top panel, and everything together has got a program, it's got a message. Okay. Um, as was already discussed by Hannah Weiss in, uh, in Sipori, uh, from promise to redemption, okay? Um, and uh, we've got Engelard who says, no, the top is redemption, the middle is God's covenant with David in Israel. How she gets David into this is very complex, but okay, with David Amelach, with Beit David and Israel. And uh, that the bottom stands for oppression of the Jews. In other words, that this is showing, what we're showing right now is the oppression of the Jews throughout the generations. And we're not going to get into how she quite gets to that. But that basically there's a progression, a program in all these mosaics that they're all interconnected. Um, a criticism of this brought by Seth Schwartz. Well, I don't usually like almost anything he says, but he says, well, Weiss gives this whole panel by panel progression in Beit Alpha, sorry, in the Sipori. If you got the panel by panel progression and it means something, and you have to have all those panels, so over here in Beit Alpha that comes afterwards, you're missing a whole bunch of the picture. It's got three panels, Sipori's got five, seven panels, where's the rest of the message? Okay, so it's it's a theory that's out there that there's got to be a message, but um, it's also a Revel Neher, a whole bunch of scholars feel there's a program, there's a message. Uh, we'll get back to the message idea soon, but let's leave that for now. Number eight, polemics. Anybody who knows what polemics are, it's basically, there is a claim, a big claim, that all these mosaics are anti-Christian. I know I've looked at it a hundred times. You guys have looked at them a hundred times. If there's, is there anything blatantly anti-Christian? That's a good question. But right now I'm pausing. I want to get to the comments since there are a bunch. It's the pre-show, but happy to see you all. Thanks, sweet Judy. Okay. How many zalot are there in Tiberias? It looks like more than 12. No, there's 12 in Tiberias. Um, was Sipor Yishul built after Beit Alpha? No, it was built before. Beit Alpha is 6th century. Now, one of the things that um, everybody assumes, and it's a, uh, you guys all know what assume spells, but everybody assumes that this one that we're looking at in Beit Alpha is the time of uh, Justinian I, early part of 6th century. There's good proof bought by a guy named Mack at Hebrew University that it's actually Justinian II later in the 6th century. Either way, it's 6th century. By, by putting it in uh, Justinian II, it's uh, at least 100 years after uh, Tsipori. Hold on a second. Okay, so where was I? Polemics. We've got Weiss, who writes about this, Kessler, a guy named Simon, Revel Neher, all sorts of people write that it's polemics. Except they're a little hard pressed to show anything really blatantly anti Christian. And this brings me to uh, one thing that I'm going to show you that is from one of my slides. Let's go down. Okay, my slides are not that good. Okay, you see that's, uh, those are both in, um, in Sipori. There's one in Sipori. See, it's a lousy shot. I have a better shot. No, I don't have a better shot. So we're gonna go way up to this one. Uh, something that Ellie Ducker was referring to, the lion and the ox. You see it at the top at Sipori. It's found in four other Batei Knesset. If you read in the literature, they'll tell you three. That's because even the guys that dug up one of the places don't realize what they dug up. Um, I forget uh, one of the places. One of the places, it's on a pillar at Chirbet Amudim. That's just a little bit north of Kibbutz Lavi. Uh, quite clearly, the lion on the ox. Um, the third, the, the place that's really the fourth, the most recent, is at Umel Kanatir, 
Shatot Rechavam, there's uh, remains of a pillar there in front of the steps of the Bet Knesset. The lion definitely has its head, its paw on the ox, the same sort of imagery here. So I'm going to do something to support this claim of polemic, very subtle polemic. Some of early Catholic art, when I say Catholic, I don't know if it's all the Christian art, but early, we're talking Byzantine period, uses the ox as an image for Jesus. So unlike what Ellie was saying, oh, the ox is an image for uh, Yosef, Ephraim, Menashe, uh, and the lion, and get away Mashiach Bet Yosef and come on Mashiach Ben David, the lion, uh, perhaps the lion with its paw on the ox is a polemic, not going to be understood by a lot of people, because even that imagery of the ox as Jesus is quite rare. It exists, but it's rare. So it's a possibility. But look at the bottom panel. What according, number seven in this picture, what according to Weiss is the bottom, and, and Netzer is the bottom panel all about? So I'm going to find the picture its way down. Sorry, things aren't in a good order, but what can you do? It, it, it's just sort of like uh, different presentations for different crowds. And I'm trying to get to it. Give me a second there. So what they're saying is that that doorway with the person's head in it is exactly like this doorway with the person's head in it, which is uh, from uh, Northern Italy, fifth century, similar time period. Um, and you have over there on the left, uh, the three angels, messengers coming to Avraham, Sarah Bepetacha Oha, that's what we have. The image on the right is the panel above it in our mosaic at uh, Tsipori or the only panel uh, with a biblical scene in Beit Alpha, the Akedat Yitzchak. So, uh, the problem is that, as you notice, most of that scene is erased. It's a little hard to jump to this conclusion. It's not terribly hard, because you see how they're doing the doorway as a doorway to a structure, and that's pretty much what we have in Sipori. So I'm going to argue that this could be an attempt to represent something anti-Christian if Christian art were showing only one halo. How do I um, try to remember how to get my cursor to do the circling thing? Okay. Um, uh, forget about it. I'll, I'm going to, if there was one halo here, why? In early church theology, uh, there was a, a way of uh, looking at, um, hold on, I want to get to the quote. Do I have the quote here? I don't have the quote, but okay. There was a way of looking at the um, three messengers coming to Abraham. As yes, there were three messengers, but it... Um, one of them was who? So according to some early theology, this was refuted afterwards by St. Augustine, but was accepted by a lot of early church fathers. One of the three messengers was Jesus. Later in the Middle Ages, it uh, becomes a whole theology in the uh, what's called Christian-Jewish debate of the high Middle Ages, that no, if three guys came, and that then Abraham bows to one, or greets one, that they three had become one, part of that Trinity concept. So we could maybe, if we had the whole picture, see how it's portrayed, and then be able to say something. But since we don't have the whole picture, the polemics here is a little bit, uh, let's call it uh, possible, but a little bit uh, not so great. Now. Um, this, by the way, is a shul with a menorah and a mosaic that's in Europe. It was dug up uh, partly by Ehud Netzer. You see the menorah right there where the person's working. Okay, I want to go back a little bit. This, by the way, is from Ma'on Nirim, where you see the menorah, you see the etrogim 
on the two sides of it. Um, okay, and again, that the, the, the motif, shofar, the Aaron Kodesh, with a parochet, without a parochet, is it only an Aaron Kodesh or is it a Beit Mikdash and an Aaron Kodesh? Is it both? Good question. But the shofar, the menorah, and uh, the machta, the incense pan. So a lot of these motifs just keep repeating. Let's um, go back. There's a quote that I want to get to. Um, okay, we'll, we'll go back to the polemics, but uh, maybe. Uh, but let's go on to Seth Schwartz. Seth Schwartz says, uh, I'm going to quote, caution and skepticism in the programmatic reading of synagogue art. In other words, he says against Weiss, against all the guys who say there's a program, almost sort of like our first guys, uh, Ephraim Elimelech Orbach and uh, others, hard to say that there's a program that you know the program, because he says, if there's a program on the seven panels, so what's the program on the three panels? If there's a program on the three panels, what's the program basically in Hamat Veri, you only have two, okay, and some of the others as well. Um, so he, he just says, um, seeing that there's no program also, I'd add Yoshua Rice, who has a whole article about uh, the various signs. Number 10, liturgy. Well, Ellie Docker went full force on that. I'm not going to really repeat it. Um, I am going to mention that both Yahalom and Fine, Stephen Fine, um, he spends a lot of time in this book on the liturgy, a lot of time. He says, you see it in Dura all the way back then, all the way through in the liturgy. And he says, definitely, it's developing hand in hand. So on the liturgy, I want to go up. There's a wonderful piece that, um, is this it? Yeah, no, that's not it. Just a little further, give me a second. I had it right here. Okay, the top uh, quote is from the um, Shalom Yisrael Synagogue in Yericho. Uh, remember for good, may the memory be for good, all of the holy community, etc. It's a nice inscription. What is pointed out here, go to the bottom part, remember for good, may your memory be for good, is from the Kaddish preserved in Aleppo, in Chaleb, from the year 1410, that's the dating of the manuscript prayer. In other words, you got a prayer here, a prayer there, it's right there, preserving the prayers in the floor. When you go to the one at, um, at uh, wait a minute, hold on one second. Um, this one, again, showing connections to Midrashim, and we discussed the connections to Midrashim before. Okay, so we've done the liturgy one, I don't wanna go into it anymore. Next, the next part, is, um, and this Midrash I also dealt with, but it's just up on the screen, didactic, that the whole reason for these floors is to teach. Kids were brought to the synagogue, adults were brought to the synagogue, Midrashim were given, Shirim were given, whoever was giving them, doesn't make a big difference. So there's a whole bunch of people, Asher Avadya, Kunel, many of them say, the whole purpose of these things are to teach. Lists are to teach, and especially when you look in the Bet Knesset in um, En Gedi. It, all the writing there, it's all a list. It's done to help you learn things, to help you study. And whether it's studying the signs of the zodiac, studying other things. Okay, we did that one. Now, one of the things that Seth Schwartz says, and there's a whole debate about this. Um, this doesn't have to do with our various opinions. Um, well, one of the things that Weiss does in one of his pictures, it's right there in the entrance hall when you go in to Tsipori. And Seth Schwartz agrees with him. He puts the people sitting off in the side, not in the nave. There's nobody sitting on the floor. That whole beautiful mosaic, you got to look at it. Okay, nobody sits on these mosaics. 
Stephen Fine says the exact opposite. People sat on them, they walked on them. It's just like in the Akko or Torah shul that we go to today. You walk on the mosaics, you stand on them. Yes, they're there, but you can still daven and have your kavana, at least most people, when you go to the um, or Torah shul synagogue in Akko, the Tunisian synagogue. Doesn't seem to bother any of the congregants there. So then the question is, if people are on these mosaics, are they really looking at them that much? Is it a central feature? If they're on the mosaics, why aren't they damaged? And that's one of the things that Seth Schwartz says they should have been damaged. Other people say that as well. Here's an answer. The answer in front of you guys, I don't know if you can see the whole thing. This is from the Cairo Geniza. It's a halachic work from Eretz Yisrael. And it says one should remove his shoes or sandals from his feet outside, enter barefoot. Slaves go barefoot in the presence of their master. Moshe and Yoshua went barefoot. Uh, and remember, there's no shoes. The shoes are taken off in the Tzipori mosaic of the Akedah scene. You go barefoot. Therefore, our ancestors in Crete, I'm skipping down near the bottom, that basins for fresh water should be placed in courtyards of synagogues for washing the feet. Remember those indentations that we have in, uh, for example, Susia. Okay. Okay. And if you're not removing your shoes because you're sickly or you can't, be careful how you walk. Don't ruin the mosaic. Okay. A very interesting source. So that would give you a reason at least to think that people are on it. So let's get to my uh, part of my theory. Okay. So I mentioned the Cairo Geniza about that. I don't have the source in front of me for the fragment that I want to go into, but I want to skip to a different picture. This is from the Shalom Yisrael Bet Knesset that's made eighth century. It's got the lulav, it's got the menorah, it's got the shofar. Shalom Yisrael is from a verse in Tehillim and Psalms. It's got a very nice geometric, maybe trying to be an Aaron Kodesh. Not that clear if, this, if that's what the uh, one labeled number two in this picture is. Okay. And I just want to go a little further down. Sorry, guys. And you see this is another shul that's got lulav and etrog, um, all sorts of different stuff. And there we go back. Okay, just a minute. Um, hold on one second. I want to go a little bit further. There we are in Getty. Okay, this is at Nirim. Unfortunately, I should have turned this the other way. Anybody recognize this one? Okay, you can't answer, but it's okay. This is a little bit of the uh, mosaic that's at Chukuk. Okay, I see Renee re waving that she recognizes it. It's from the mosaic at Chukuk where we've got Shimshon and we've got also the one in Wadi Haman with Shimshon, at least according to the archaeologists who dug. Uh, various other scenes as well, possibly um, uh, Shimon at Sadiq reading Alexander the Great. That's the scene with the elephants at uh, Chukuk. Not 100% sure, but possibly. Um, no, I don't want to get to that yet. We'll just leave it here for now. So, Cairo Geniza fragment has, uh, now I'll tell you a little bit about myself. This is something that Judy wanted me to say on Thursday, and I sort of skipped it. Um, I have rabbinic ordination. That and 2 bucks 75 gets me on the subway in New York. But um, I'm also a gabai. Every decade of my life, except my first decade, and I've been a member of the Vada of the Bet Knesset. My approach to this whole thing is very different than any of these art scholars, uh, archaeologists, uh, you know, history scholars, and everything else. And it's got to do with a Cairo Geniza fragment that asks a rabbi in writing, "What should we do in our synagogue?" By the way, it's dated to being at the eighth century. 
Um, eighth century is a time of turmoil. A lot of Jews leave Eretz Yisrael. They go to Alexandria, to Cairo, to all sorts of other places. They go to Bavel, they go to Europe. And um, when the Jews go to this congregation, they write a, um, a question. It's in writing. Um, a whole bunch of Jews from Eretz Yisrael join the congregation and they want to change the Nusach, they want to change the Min Hagdim. Let's say they probably became the majority. And the question is, do we let them, do we not let them? They're now the majority. Can we do this? Can we change? Or can we adapt? Can we assume some of them? Missing from the Cairo Geniza fragment is the answer. Loved, I'd love to have the answer. But, um, and this is where I come to respond to. Responds a sheila to tshuva. That's what this is. This is a sheila in writing. We don't have the answer. Uh, if you go and respond to literature throughout the centuries, there's almost no questions like this. Okay, this is sort of like unique. But questions about the minhag of the shul, nothing like that. I once asked Sion Badash in Akko. There's no rabbi there. There's still no rabbi in the shul. I said, what do you do when you have a question? He says, we've never had a question. I said, no question whatsoever on halacha, on practice, on minhag, on the artwork. He said, no, we never had a question. Not one whatsoever. He said, there was once. Once? So Tzion Zichon Adabacha said, once? I said, what did you do? He said, we asked the chief rabbi in Akko. And he answered the Shaiva. He couldn't even remember what the question was, but he said once. Okay, so basically one of the things um, that I feel, and I know from historical evidence, from archaeological evidence, from the Shailot Tshuvat, from rabbinic works, the concept that we have of a synagogue rabbi is a brand new concept. It's 20th century, a little bit in the 19th century. This whole concept is very new. There were rabbis for cities, there were rabbis for districts, there were heads of academies. They get questions in writing, they'd answer. That was it. All again, very little about anything to do with synagogue practice. I'm going to give you a true story that happened to a rabbi named Beryl. This is not made up, guys. That's really his name. I just won't give the rest of it. He took a, um, a stella, new position, this is in the 20th century, in a synagogue with a lot of, uh, that most of the congregation were German Jews. He was not. And they started to do, on the first Chag that came, something that's called Yotzrot. Yotzrot are sort of like P.U.T. that are written, that are added in brachot of tefillat arvit, of other tefillot. He said to the community, you can't do that, it's a hefseg. Most rabbis wrote against it. The community said to him, but it's our menha. He said, but it's, it, you can't do that. I, 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 so basically the, rab, the community said to him, Rabbi, this is what we do. You don't like it, you can leave. Okay, so um, what I'm saying is that rarely um, do we have this sort of rabbinic involvement in synagogues throughout history, especially in early periods? Um, from my point of view as a gabbai, uh, for many years, the last thing we ever wanted to do was go and get certain rabbis here in Efrat involved in some of our questions, in some of our issues. We only would do it guardedly. Um, when you have a synagogue rabbi, it's almost like the fact though that he's involved. But what happens, who hires the synagogue rabbi? The vad of the shul. The president, the vad, the head of the vad, the chairman of the board, whatever you want to call it. It's a very different mindset than what all these guys are going to. Oh, the rabbis couldn't have approved. Rabbis weren't there. I'm not saying they weren't there for prayers. They weren't involved in the planning and stages. So I'll give you a great example. 
again, 20th century, there was a certain uh, synagogue being built here in Efrat. There were two people involved in its construction stage, the chief rabbi and the architect. Chief rabbi um, was not very good at reading ar architectural plans. The architect had never ever built a synagogue. One day the Arab who was building, you know, the, the foreman said to the contractor, one of the foremen, the Arab said, how are the women getting up there? Missing in the plan for this whole synagogue, the one that I pray at, was a staircase to the women's section. I, Renee's making like, I can't believe it. Yes, well, the rabbi doesn't know how to read plans. The architect had never designed a synagogue before in his life. And there was no staircase. Don't worry, we have one. We have a staircase, we have an elevator, but it was all put in after the fact. Okay, so if um, so in the synagogue, what do we know that they did have? From ancient texts, from inscriptions, there was somebody called an archisynagogus. Okay, now we know what an archbishop is, archbishop. Archisynagogus doesn't mean he's some sort of big rabbi. There's a Rosh Knesset mentioned in Midrashim. Doesn't say he's a rabbi, okay? We do have the terms presbyters, all that sort of thing, but we're sort of like missing somebody who's called a rabbi. There is a Cathedra de Moshe. There's that seat for Moshe, whatever it means. Maybe the honored guest speaker, maybe the rabbi, maybe also, or a rabbi who came to give a drasha. But the concept of, um, hey, uh, let's go to uh, Beit Alpha for a minute. Guys, you know the film in Beit Alpha? Uh, a lot of us think it's very uh, kitschy. But in the film in Beit Alpha, the guy with the sample book, when he's showing, you know, the ver various, here, do you want this, do you want that? According to a whole school of uh, people, uh, Weitzman, Kessler, all sorts of scholars, they did have sample books. These guys came with them pick from the sample book. So maybe there's no message, maybe there's no theory, maybe there's no uh, connection uh, between all the various synagogue art. Just, you know, pick something. They didn't necessarily, like in the Beit Alpha, have somebody other than an elder there, uh, president of the synagogue, somebody like that, the Archis Synagogus. But uh, who knows if the community in Beit Alpha even had access to a rabbi to say this, mosaic was good or this mosaic was not good. So I want to skip to another thing that we see in this one. This is a Na'aran, the full mosaic, where there's a lot of uh, iconoclasm, erasing of images. Um, when or who did that? Big debate, I just want to discuss it for a minute. There's three schools of thought. It was done by the Jews themselves as they started to get wary of images. They didn't like this anymore because most of them, we see it is sixth century onwards, and then you go to the one that was made eighth century in Yericho, and there's no images, okay? A different theory that was done by the Arabs, they forced it upon us, there's a whole school of thought that the Arabs did it, and then there's a third theory that, well, everybody was doing it, the Christians were doing it, the Arabs were doing it, so the Jews did it too, because it sort of like became the, the cultural milieu that the people had, let's get rid of the icons, let's get rid of the images. So I was at a lecture at the Met about seven or eight years ago. Uh, Stephen Fine presented something about, uh, you know, his stuff. There was a different guy, and I forget the name, who had a whole presentation that basically said almost all of the erasures in Lebanon, in South Jordan, in, um, uh, sorry, in Jordan, in South Syria, and in Israel, basically what we call the Levant, were done around the year 760. This is the Abbasids. They had set up a whole system with governors and sub-governors, whatever you want to call it, and that the local guy was basically a forerunner of ISIS, ISIL, uh, Al-Qaeda. He was against images. He had them wiped out every place. The guy showed a bunch of slides how they were done. And the way he showed, he didn't show any from Batei Knesset, by the way, but the way they were done was exactly the way we see it done at Susia. 
that is all fine and well and might fit some of the synagogues that were erased, but Naharan was only 5th, 6th century, according to the archaeologists. Except remember, this is 1919. We don't have new digs. A little hard to date the thing. So was it erased really in a later period in the 8th century? Did it continue to be used or not? Good question. We'll just leave that as a little possibility. I want to see the chats, which I haven't checked for a while. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, just a minute. Oh, there's a lot of things here, hold on. Uh, at first glance, it's Christian symbolism, offering and redemption of Isaac, yes, uh, and the like. Uh, and she says, oh, sorry. Son, as Constantine used this syncretically. Okay, yeah, symbolizing Christianity as the new sun, shining uh, earth as Christianity and the new Israel. Uh, okay. Uh, by the way, Huey is right. In Christian mosaics, they had Helios and Helen, 6th century in in, um, in Beichan, the exact same time as Beit Alpha. They had in, um, uh, just give me a minute, in South Jordan, in, in um, Madaba, they had the four seasons, but they never had it all together with the zodiac. That came later in Christian art, yes. And in the later Christian art, when they have the zodiac, guess who's in the middle? Jesus himself. Okay. No, did I mean Abraham was once one of the messengers, Renee? No, that the three messengers that came to Abraham, that one of them was Jesus. I think Jesus was. Like before Jesus was born, Jesus visited Abraham. Yeah, okay. Um, so... Uh, Yukum Prakan is said in some Eastern and Yemenite communities. Uh, I'm not sure what the relevance is, but in a minute we'll open up for discussion and we'll find out. Chukuk, Noah building the ark or Joseph the carpenter. Uh, okay, yes, I was, wasn't showing the whole mosaic or any of the mo other mosaics from uh, Chukuk. Just a little piece, it's not, uh, he's too pudgy to be Shimshon, yes, he is too, that's not meant to be Shimshon. Rabbi Beryl, yes, it is Rabbi Beryl. Uh, if you want to know which Rabbi Beryl, you can uh, write me offline, Ezra. Um, how do you make a second floor without a way to get up there? <laughs> it's amazing, but they did it, I'm a witness. There was a second floor, we put in a little tiny temporary staircase, from the back of the men's section that later when we built a whole other staircase on top of the one to get to the men's section to get to the women's section. Then we had a problem, the height, because the ceiling curves. Let's put it this way, any women over about six foot one have a problem coming into the women's section because they're going to bang their heads. Yeah, how do you make, the architect did not realize the need for a separate entrance. Yeah, the architect, what can I tell you? I don't know uh, what he was doing. Rabbi in Artura, Tunisian synagogue in Akko, is Rabbi Mordechai, Mor Hadassi. Uh, that might be current. He's my son's brother-in-law. Okay, during the final years of Sion, that's current. But when I asked Sion, it was back before he became the Rav. There was no Rav in the shul. Currently, there might be a Rav. Okay. Uh, okay, Alan, there were those who said that it was done by Jews who no longer approved of the images. Uh, there's a guy named Stern who I mentioned in last week's lecture. He feels as Judaism progressed, developed, people started to re-examine the image and started to say, you know what, it's pasnished. That's Yiddish guys for, it's just not right having these images on the floor, so let's erase them. Um, I'm not so sure that he's correct about that, and that's why I brought in the lecture at the Met, which seems to say it's got nothing to do with it. So now what I'd like to do, uh, Judy, is get back, how do I do this, um, to where I can see everybody. 
Stop screen sharing. Stop screen share. That's a good idea. Okay. Uh, stop share. Stop share. It didn't do it. Did it do it? Ah, yes. Okay, and if you can unmute everybody, because I really would like, uh, with this to conclude, we've done the time that I had allotted. If you've got um, any obvious questions, a way to do this, um, I only see some of you in the picture. Raise your hand one at a time. No. We'll try. Yeah. I just wanted to you say you didn't understand the uh, connection between Yakum Tukun. Okay, when I wrote, you yeah. talked about liturgy and you brought up the synagogue in uh, Shalom al Yisrael. Yes. And the description there, okay, is basically a subscription to a prayer for all who do public works and so on and so forth. And some of the scholars believe that, that that was a nusach that was used. Okay, that in other words, similar to the Akum Purkun, we say on Shabbat. So okay. that, that was the liturgy that was used, and possibly the community there, okay, that some believe came from the, what do you call it, from the Hijaz. Okay, was brought in, okay, with, uh, with the Arabs when they came in. Possible. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so... Um, See, people are raising yeah. their hands. Yeah, okay. Tova sent me a, a wonder... Um, I have to mention this now to everybody. Tova sent me a wonderful uh, midrash, in which... Uh, not It's midrashic, it's rashi, on Breshi, that um, when Hashem shows Avram the stars, the midrash, Rashi says, or midrashically, he showed the stars from on high. If you um, are into, if, if Bnei Yisrael uh, don't believe the, the, you know, do the mitzvot, then the Zodiac won't affect them. But if Bnei Yisrael aren't doing the mitzvot, then it'll be like from down below and the signs of the Zodiac will affect them. So like I say, in, in medieval Jewish thought, the Zodiac affecting Bnei Yisrael, not, not affecting Bnei Yisrael, um, all these midrashim that I brought you, all the things he's, in the slideshow. He's not wearing a kippa, by the way. Who's not? Oh, wow. I am. That's what you said. Oh, it was, yes. He put his head down and he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard to see. Yeah, yeah no, it's just a little. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's over. An incredibly simple point. I mean, I just never thought about it before until you showed the photo of your grandchildren. At some point in Jewish history, like images stopped being a problem. So apparently that happened during the Byzantine times. The question is, how did it stop being a problem? It just wasn't a problem. No, it, oh, it was paganistic. What, it was paganistic. Okay, what I what I basically brought from in the last week's talk was that a lot of Chazal saw two dimensional, and even Rav Cook as not a problem. Once you're two dimensional. It's not a problem, okay? And remember, there's, um, it's in one of the sources I brought. Targum, pseudo Jonathan, says you can bow down on the mosaics on floors. Just wow. don't pray to the mosaics on the floor. In other words, you're not praying to it. It was recognizing that the people realize these two dimensional images aren't something that we worship, aren't something that we pray to. So how did it transition from geometric patterns in Herod's time to actual images. What was the link? What was the, how do you connect the dots? Uh, I think that does go to the calendars. I think there's a little bit to that argument still going back to uh, Michal Aviona, going, uh, continuing today with Rachel Chachlili and going to what Levine says. Once they intercal intercalated the uh, calendar, and that's about the 350s. So a little bit later, they put in a calendar in a synagogue, but they also put in Jewish motifs. Later came the message. It's a little hard, guys, not to think that there's some sort of message with the three panels, the seven panels, and with the mosaic, the zodiac, specifically, with Helios, with the four horse thing, with the stars, the moon, the sun, there, the four seasons, without there being some sort of program. So I believe, yeah, there's some sort of program. 
it's a little bit hard for us to say what it is. I'm not nearly as sure as Zev Weiss is and some of these other guys. Oh, I have the answer. I know what the program is. I know what the message is. Maybe different people viewed it different ways, different levels. Um, uh, and I want to conclude with one last thing. This is my conclusion, then I'll say goodbye. You want to write me offline, however, go ahead. Yeah, There's I a neighbor of mine here in Efrat. Her grandfather was Shai Agnon. And she said, this is not the type of grandfather that was extremely, you know, sit on his lap all the time, that approachable. But he was still, he was a nice grandfather. And one day she got an assignment in day school in the upper grades to write a report about one of Shai Agnon's writings. So she said, knocked on Saba's door and said, Saba, and he said, yes. Could you help me with a school project? And he said, yes. He said, I need to write about this poem you wrote, about this writing. So she wrote a paper and she presented it and the teacher gave her an eight, not a ten, nine or 10, an eight, maybe even a seven, an eight. It was a good passing grade, but an eight. And the teacher's comment was, oh, that's very nice, wonderful theory, but that's not what Shai Agnon meant. Okay, I see Oni is clapping and you love it, okay. With that, I want to conclude. We're not quite sure what these guys meant. It, I believe the liturgy is involved. I believe there is somewhat of a program. Is there polemic? Maybe. Maybe. Is there any of this other stuff? Is that really a de de depiction of Rabbana Sholem? I like the idea in the Yalkut Shimoni that it's sort of showing um, the 12 of everything. And when you get to the, you know, the 12 months, the 12 days, the 12 hours, all of that stuff. Um, hey, uh, I think that uh, maybe, as you said, the polemics might have been at the same time, including the composition of some of the Midrashim, I believe. I like when I'm, you know, we're dealing with tourists, and I yeah. enjoy bringing a Midrash from Yaguchi Moni. Yeah. The Midrash is standing there, and it says in the Midrash that Abraham okay, had a, uh, a necklace, and on that necklace was a very precious stone, okay, it says in the Al-Qut Shimoni. Yes. And when, what do you call it? when Avram died, Akadosh Baruch Hu took that stone and placed it in the heavens, and it was the Chama, so that it would heal people. Yeah. Okay? Would I didn't bring that Midrash, but I yeah. know that Midrash, yes. Right, so is that medrash as a result of people asking, what's the question between Abraham and the, and the son? Okay, or did the medrash come before? Okay, people could have come into these, you know, medrash, Eretz Yisrael, come into the Batei Knesset and ask the questions that we're asking. And all of a sudden, someone writes the medrash about it. So, so we don't know. Well, again, with the, with the liturgy, one of the things that Fine says, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's at the same time. In other words, you're getting these mosaics, you're getting uh, um, uh, Rabbi Lezer Akaliri, you're getting Yanai and other people writing Midrashim, sorry, uh, Piyutim, that have in it the Zodiac. We still say them to this day, which is in itself pretty amazing. We still have Zodiacs to this day, like I mentioned in the entrance hall to the main building of Yeshiva University, whether you put a carpet on it or not. So, um, you know, there's all sorts of stuff we could talk about, but guys, it's time to sign off. Very hard to say goodbye from one of these chats. I love seeing all of you. It's good to see you all, uh, and bye.